It was a game that seemed one of the next to the last moment of the second overtime. It was all over, but it went on into a third overtime. It was a game that started on Friday and ended on Saturday. It was a game that the fans in Boston Garden, a nationwide audience, will never forget. It was a game they're calling the greatest in NBA history. It was a game that became an integral part of the selling 13th NBA championship. But it was a game that was just one part of the Boston Celtic playoff story. A story worth telling again. On April 11th, 1976, the NBA teams played the last game of the regular season. On April 13th, the qualifying teams started the long climb that would eventually lead to the NBA championship for one team. The playoffs were underway. The second season had begun. The Boston Celtics started the second season in the Garden against a formidable foe, the Buffalo Braves. The Celtics had won four, but lost three to the Braves in the regular season play. In the first two playoff games, Boston had little trouble with the Braves on the Garden floor. But in game two, the Boston lineup seemed different. It looked as though there was something missing. And indeed there was. John Havlicek had injured a foot and was not in the lineup. The Celtics had taken the first game by nine. Without Hondo, they took the second by five. And then the series moved to Buffalo. Buffalo won those two games to tie the series. Even without Havlicek, the Celtics came within two points of winning on the Buffalo home court. Boston took an 11-point victory in Game 5 and came back to the Buffalo Auditorium for a crucial Game 6 of the series. John Havlicek, who had played 35 minutes in Game 5, scoring just but 8 points, was in the starting lineup for the Celtics. The Boston starting five were playing their usual game, although John Havlicek, obviously unable to jump on his injured foot, was not getting his share of rebounds. Silas and Cowens easily made up for that. Hondo was playing his steady floor game that has pulled the Celtics out of many a tight situation. All through three quarters of play, McAdoo and Randy Smith were answering Boston charges with baskets of their own. The Celtics started on top, and Buffalo came back to own a five-point lead at halftime. In the third quarter, it was Boston's fifth starter who came alive. Charlie Scott came on for Boston. At the end of the third quarter, the Braves had a one-point lead. A Charlie Scott jumper put the Celtics up by a point at the beginning of the fourth quarter. The Celtics fought to stay there. DeGregorio, Smith, and McAdoo brought the Braves back. But Charlie Scott broke their heart. Charlie scored nine Boston points in a row and hit on nine consecutive shots. It was what led up to Charlie's ninth point that broke the Braves' heart. A sensational steal that put the Celtics ten points ahead with four minutes left in the game. The Braves closed the score, but it was never in doubt after that, and Boston was on its way to the Eastern Conference Finals, the second step of the playoffs. The Cleveland Cavaliers had won their way into the playoffs with the third best record in the entire NBA. Then, to prove it was no fluke, they beat the Washington Bullets in a seven-game first-round series. The Celtics and the Cavaliers traded home court victories right through Game 5. And as Game 6 opened in the Midwest Coliseum, the home court advantage had led to a 3-2 lead for the Celtics. 
Now it seemed that it would be Cleveland's turn to win again, for they have the home court advantage. And 21,564 screaming fans cheering them on. The Celtics, led by JoJo White and Dave Cowan, jumped out to an early lead. But then Austin Carr, Jim Brewer, and the veteran Nate Thurman started to bring Cleveland back. And at halftime, Cleveland led by three points. In the third quarter, Boston caught up, passed the Cavaliers, and then the lead seemed to change every time one team or the other would get the ball. The Cavaliers carried a two-point lead into the fourth quarter. Then Silas tied the game and Clemens put Cleveland ahead. The scoring of JoJo White, Dave Cowens, and Charlie Scott had kept Boston in the game all evening long. Nate Thurman put a three-point play together to put Cleveland that many points ahead. Then JoJo White started hitting from the left side of the court. With a minute and three quarters to go, the Celtics had a shaky one-point lead. The Cavaliers had the ball, and then Charlie Scott's fast hand took that ball down the court, and Scott stopped it. That move gave the Celtics a three-point lead with a minute and a half in the game. It broke Cleveland's heart, their spirit, as the Celtics went on to take a seven-point victory on the Eastern Conference title. Meanwhile, in the Western Conference, the defending champion Golden State Warriors ran into a buzzsaw called the Phoenix Suns. The Suns, who were supposed to have no chance in the playoffs, extended the Golden State Warriors to seven games. The seventh game was played at Oakland Coliseum where the Warriors were near invincible. It made the Suns' one-sided victory all the more devastating. So the Phoenix Suns were to meet the Boston Celtics in the championship round of the NBA playoffs. At stake, the NBA championship and the Walter Brown Trophy. The first two games in Boston Garden before a capacity house went to the Boston Celtics without too much trouble. The second game was a classic Boston victory. Five men scored in double figures. The injured John Havlicek, although not starting, led all with 23 points. The 15-point victory put thoughts of a four-game sweep into the heads of the Boston fans. But as the series moved to the Arizona desert, the Selleck fans found out it was not to be, and they found out the hard way. In game three, the rookie of the year, Alvin Adams, put in 33 points, then ex-Celtic Paul Westfall 22, as the Suns came up seven-point victors and made the series two to one. Game four was a Donnybrook. Phoenix had jumped out once again on the scoring of Westfall Adams and Gar Hurd, who was protecting their board. But then the Selleck came on after they had spotted the Suns an 11-point lead. The Selleck kept chipping away at it. They kept closing the gap, White and Hondo and Cowan. Until with just one second left, Phoenix led by but two points. And when JoJo White shot, the potential game-tying basket was just off target. Phoenix had tied the series 108 to 107. Now the series moved back to Boston for game five. Once again, Boston Garden had a capacity crowd. Once again, the season ticket holders had the choice vantage seat. Even before the crowd got settled, the Celtics were on their way. Cowan. Then Silas. Then White. Then Hamlicek, as the starting five started a pound on the Phoenix Suns and jumped out to a 20-point lead in the first quarter. They made it seem easy on offense. On defense, maybe too easy. The Suns started chipping away at the lead. Slowly they came back with Perry or Hurd or Westfall. Most often the two rookie sensations, Alvin Adams and Ricky Sobers. 
In the fourth period, the teams were trading baskets, and when Westfall Steel turned into a three-point play, the teams were finally tied with just 39 seconds to play. Curtis Perry put Phoenix ahead by making one of two free throw attempts. And Hondo tied the game up by making one of his two with 19 seconds left. And as time ran out, the score stood 95 for Boston, for Phoenix, 95. The first overtime was a defensive battle. Six points scored by each team as the club seemed to be playing in each other's jersey. As the first overtime came to a close, the score stood locked again, this time at 101. As the second overtime opened, the guards traded basket. Jojo White put in two for Boston. The score was tied at 105. Then with one minute left in the period, Boston ahead 107 to 106. An offensive foul call put Dave Cowens out of game number five. A white drive put the Celtics three points ahead. Dick Van Arsdale answered from the baseline and now Phoenix trailed by one point. Westfall stole the inbound pass down to Perry, and Perry, with five seconds left in the game, put Phoenix ahead by one. Then a sensational running shot by John Havlicek won the game, or so everyone on the Boston Garden thought. and left Phoenix took time out. The Celtics were ahead by one point. But Phoenix didn't have a timeout left. So a technical foul was called and Jojo White made the penalty free throw with just one second left, putting Boston ahead 112 to 110. But the master strategy of John McLeod paid off. Phoenix got the ball in the half court and an inbound pass to Hurd, a high arcing jumper, and the game was tied at the buzzer at 112. For the first time in NBA history, a championship round game went into the third overtime. Now with both starting centers on the bench having fouled out of the game, the clubs were playing a different style of ball. Curtis Perry put Phoenix up by two. Boston fans remembered the last overtime championship game here in the Garden. They remembered and they worried, for the Celtics lost that in the closing moments of the second overtime to the Milwaukee Bucks. Jojo White tied it up from the baseline, then some excellent defensive work got the ball back into Boston control. It was then that the Boston bench came through. Len McDonald, brought along slowly by the Celtics, paid them back for their patience. Two baskets put the Celts up by four points. Westfall brought it back down to two. But Jojo White's unerring eye from 21 feet pulled them four ahead. And McDonald at the free throw 
line, put them up by six. Sober's got the margin down to 126 to 122. After two hard free throws, Westfall cut the margin once again to four points with just 25 seconds left. The Celts were ahead 128 to 124. Westfall came again and brought the lead down to two. Phoenix put the pressure on, but the Boston boys would not break. Jojo White, who played all but two minutes of the game, retained control of the ball, and for 12 seconds, the Suns could not touch it. The game that started on June 4th, a Friday night, ended on Saturday morning. The Celtics had won the longest, most dramatic, most friendly game in NBA history. A game that will never be forgotten by a capacity crowd there, nor the millions that saw it on national television. Two days later, the same two teams met for game six of the championship playoff. Once again, there was a capacity crowd. Only this time, they were in the arena called the Manhouse on McDowell Street. The Phoenix fans were out in full force, and they were out for blood. Boston. The Suns had sworn revenge. They said they would take this game and return once more to Boston's Garden and turn it around there. The game was rugged, the play sensational. After three quarters, only one point separated the two teams. The lead had changed hands four times. The game had been tied ten times. Going into the fourth period, it was very much anyone's ball game. With eight minutes left in the ball game, Paul Westfall drives to tie the score and Sobers adds another one to put Phoenix ahead by one. It will be seven minutes before the Phoenix Suns score another basket. In those seven minutes, they pick up just seven points in free throws. In those seven minutes, the Celtics take a 10-point lead. Dave Cowan spearheads the attack. But it's not just Cowan, it's Havlicek. And Jojo White. Then Charlie Scott. And the play under both baskets of Paul Silas. The scoring is there and in between the defensive play that keeps the powerful Suns from scoring one basket in those frigid seven minutes. Frigid for Phoenix. Sizzling for the Celtics. It's a complete victory for Boston. The offense shines, the defense sparkles. Boston had returned to the top of the mountain and once again had the right to call themselves the Boston Celtics, best in the NBA, champions of the world. <laughs>